what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Hit it, boy. Coming out, um, I have the distinct honor of um, introducing one of the most successful entrepreneurs of our generation. Uh, growing up in Akron, Ohio, as an athlete himself, uh, and with his childhood friend LeBron, uh, this gentleman uh, decided to take a look at the sports and media and marketing and entertainment system and thought differently. Uh, he thought about what was possible to build a brand to understand marketing. And through some distinct friendships with folks at places like Nike and Apple, he developed a vision. And with that vision, a very authentic voice. And pragmatically built uh, an empire uh, from that in thinking about the ways that athletes and young entrepreneurs could intersect with the sports industry as part of that. As the CEO of the Spring Hill Company, he set out to develop content, things like the shop, uninterrupted, working with Warner Brothers, Disney's, Stars, major media companies, and building that as an opportunity for new voices within their platforms. Additionally, he worked on products and building his own products, helping with Beats by Dre to develop a strategy within sports, and then going on to be able to have uh, major deals done with franchises, a deal with uh, Fenway Sports Group, the Boston Red Sox, my big passion, Liverpool Football Club, and really set forth to become that empire that he set out to, to develop. While many times on his journey, he might have felt like a disruptor as an entrepreneur, facing a very entrenched and somewhat insulated sports marketing or sports industry, he was a pioneer as a young African-American entrepreneur as a partner with an athlete, he made those voices and the boardrooms expect to be a part of those discussions. And I would say that he's a little bit more of a developer because he's developed a new path, a new expectation. While there's many athletes who have gone on to lead very successful business lives post-career, what Maverick did was really came up with an opportunity for the expectation that athletes while they're on the court and while they're on the field, they have the opportunity to use their voice and to be entrepreneurs during their playing careers. And for that, he's an inspiration to all of us, and he's an inspiration to all that follow in future generations. So on behalf of UCLA Anderson, uh, the Center for Media, Entertainment, and Sports, I would like to welcome and introduce the 2022 Game Changer Award recipient, Maverick Carter. Wow, beautiful room. <laughs> Thank you, my man. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say thank you um, to UCLA Anderson and obviously the Center for Media, Entertainment, and Sports for giving me this honor. Um, standing up here in front of this beautiful room is an honor. Um, I did not attend business school, but uh, I love to learn, um, love to know about people, love to meet people. So for that, I would say most importantly, Thank you to Anderson. Thank you for the Center of Media, Entertainment, and Sports. But most importantly, thank you guys all for being here, listening to me, and allowing me to learn from you today as we have this wonderful conversation. And thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce who will lead a discussion and a conversation with Maverick, the Chief Operating Officer of Nike and proud UCLA Anderson alum, <laughs> Andy Campion. Thank you, guys. Oh, we don't need it. We don't need it. I think we're mic'd up. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, my man. Uh, and just to make sure.
I feel like I gotta an athlete. I got to get out of that picture. I need to lean out of that picture. I feel like an athlete again. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to start by saying Mav said he didn't, come, he didn't go to business school. Mav actually, a few months ago, so I'll back up. Mav and I got to know each other about a year and a half ago, maybe. Became fast friends. We talk about no dip. It's just been up in terms of our friendship. Um, part of that's because I've learned a tremendous amount from him. That's why he's getting this award. He is known for having a passionate curiosity. I'm pretty, I'm pretty curious uh, myself, uh, mostly because of what you can learn from others. There's a John Wooden quote, what's most important is what you learn after you think you know it all. And um, I know that quote makes, you know, pushes me every day, it pushes me, and I've learned a ton from him. But he said, I, want, he said, I, I'm, I didn't go to business school. Mav hadn't really spent much time at UCLA before, and about a month or two ago, I see Martin Germond, our AD, in the front row. He goes, I gotta go to Poly. I haven't been to Poly. You gotta take me to a game at Poly, which is funny, right? Mav saying, you gotta take me to a game, <laughs> right? And, um, and so um, then this, you know, this pandemic and the circumstance that we're in pushed a few of those games out. So we haven't made it. So the first visit Mavs made to UCLA is to UCLA Anderson Business that is School. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Um, which, uh, um, which came by way of an awesome honor that uh, the school has given to him, um, the Game Changer Award. It couldn't be a more fitting title for the award based on what I'm getting to know um, about and from Mavs. So my role here is um, it's not. It, this has nothing to do with me. I'm I'm like a I'm like a. a a facilitator of you getting to know Maverick a little bit. I'm gonna ask him a couple of questions to get this rolling, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience to ask Mav some questions. So first question, Mav, context. This is a business school. This is specifically a focus on media, entertainment, and sports, but it's within a business school. And in the world of business, I think um, what we've all um, probably read about, heard about, seen to some extent in, in terms of action, um, but certainly in terms of intention and talk, is businesses talking about not being purely profit motivated or shareholder motivated or growth motivated. Um, as I know from working at two big companies, Disney, Nike, sometimes when you change what you're focused on, you're really fighting inertia and it takes you a lot longer to shift uh, what drives you as a company and what you're focused on or what matters most. Mav uh, founded Spring, the Spring Hill Company and uh, we, Nike, one of those big companies that has great intentions, um, invested in Spring Hill in part to be a catalyst for some of the things that we want to do. And I um, have the like lucky um, position to, to be able to sit on the board and, and represent Nike there. Um, and learn. And Maverick kicked off the first board meeting we had after the um, pretty significant round of investment that several different entities made in his company. And he shared what the company was all about. And what really struck me is that this is a company that's all about what I'm going to ask him to share and has been since day one. And so they're not fighting inertia. They're building momentum against this. And so Mav, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what is it that drives Spring Hill? And and, and how that helps you think about what you do and what you don't do. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you for asking that, Andy. I, you know, I am uh, naive enough to believe that you can, as I say, do well while doing good, meaning do the right thing while growing a company, growing revenue, growing profit. All of that shit's important, but I think you can do well and I mean, do good at the same time. And I believe that because I was fortunate enough in my career a um, long time ago, even, and Andy's been at Nike now a long time, but before Andy was there, a decade before Andy was there, I was an intern at Nike and worked there as an intern and then was a consultant at the company while I was still in college. Then I actually dropped out of college to go work at Nike. And, and as I tell people, I graduated from Nike. But I was there when Phil Knight was still the CEO and the, who's the founder of the company, as we all know. So, and I didn't interact with Phil much at all, but I got little bits and pieces of interaction with him. Then went on and left and, and started my own thing and got to see other companies. So then I could put the two against each other and go, okay, what's the difference here? And what you quickly realize is that the closer the people, the people or the person who started a company, are still there, then that 
pool of why the hell did we actually start this company yeah. is still there. And the further away you are from the people or the person who started it, the more you get into, oh, it's just about profit or volume or, you know, every business has different KPIs, as they call them, um, that determine the business. But I, once I left Nike, I was the managing athlete, so I got to see these other big companies, bigger than Nike, some even. And I quickly started to, that was actually business school for me because I was remembering what I saw and de dealt with and heard in meetings, not getting to say much then at Nike and then going to these other places. And what I quickly realized is it's all, most of it and things that happen at companies and, and it really does happen at big companies is just human emotion. So when you think about, I was, uh, they asked me a question about um, advice I would give to uh, someone graduating from business school I was saying, Storytelling, like, and storytelling people go, oh, movies and TV, uh-uh, that's just like a tiny piece of it. When you go into an interview, that's storytelling. When you have dinner with people, people are telling stories, like, always working on how you tell a story and, and authentically do that, because storytelling is what emotionally connects to people. So then, when you take that and layer it on, okay, well then when you're running a company, you're really telling a story, right? So yeah. our story at Spring Hill, it's authentic, but it's ultimately a story is empowerment. It's true, it's who I am. LeBron empowered me, it's what I believe in. It's the reason I can sit here on this stage with the chief operating officer at Nike at a big fancy business school and didn't even get under, because it's, it's, it's our story, it's who we are. So when you think about Nike, it's a story. Disney is a story, it's, not, it's actually not a company. It's a story that became a company, right? Mm -hmm. Phil Empowerment started off trying to build the best shoe for runners, and then that became basketball, like, and Bill, and it still says it, right? And Phil has a line, never stop hearing the voice of the athlete. So the story becomes the business, and and then that's, in that story is human emotion. So you start to look at companies, I would look at these big companies and go, oh, I see, you could literally see it, you've seen it. People who are just protecting their job, right? They're going like, this is what I do. So Andy, you can't do this because this is what I do. Mm -hmm. So what I quickly realized, I was like, oh shit. And then what? Then the, your reaction is to go, oh well, this is what I do legal. So marketing, stay out of legal. You can't tell mm -hmm. me what to do in legal. Marketing goes, you stuff, and it's just a bunch of this. And really, what people are doing is they're protecting their job and they're afraid to let someone else in because it might expose how mediocre they are. So then you realize quickly. But well, mediocrity is contagious. It like spreads like wildfire. So I go to into some of these big companies and there just be floors and floors and floors of mediocre people at big brands that you all know that are great brands that are now they're all about volume and the stock price and bullshit that, that is not what the company was started for if you go back to the founders. So I'm just naive to believe you can do both, but you need someone uh, you need you need to guard against that territorialism that breeds mediocrity. You have to have it, and the best way to do it is to have the people who started the company. Like my company, I started it, right? So, so I, I, the board, I have the board with Andy and other people, but I show up to the board and go, this is what I want to do, this is what yeah. I believe, because this is what I really, truly believe. Now, revenue and profit is, I'm thinking about it, but it's not one, two, three, four on my list, right? Yeah. It's down the list, so you have to really really have people there, either the founder or the founders, or people who really give a shit about the company, and not just about their job or their salary or how they get their bonus, and that's how you really guard against that natural human emotion of being territory, which leads to mediocrity, which leads to a company that's just a bunch of people being mediocre to drive numbers, and eventually that catches everybody. Yeah, the, um, it's interesting, so you referenced Phil Knight, you went to Nike U, yep. and you said they don't really give you a degree. It is a campus, my two favorite campuses in the world are probably Nike and Portland and UCLA. Um, but in many ways it is like a degree because back to your passion and curiosity, we're fortunate to have a founder who is a strong rudder and keeps reminding us what's most important. You're, for you, that's empowerment. Phil often will say, and, and now you know him well, so he may have said this to you. You know, if we focus on what matters most to us, which is listening to the voice of the athlete, providing innovation and inspiration to the athlete, 
we'll make money damn near automatic. So his, you know, his approach is stay focused on what makes Nike Nike. What is the Nike story? Yours has been empowerment. It really struck me at that board meeting um, to share a, t a very brief antidote. We were talking about whether you would do X or Y in terms of a partnership or an acquisition. And, and I asked, you know, those kind of board member type questions. Like, how do you think about, you know, what's the strategic rationale for this, that, and the other? And it came all the way back to where he started, which was empowerment. If this partnership or this acquisition doesn't help foster and fuel empowerment, it's not really what we're about. Somebody else can do it. And so that's going to transition to the second question. So, Mav, you'll, you've created amazing content at this company. You're wearing the Space Jam shoes. I appreciate the, the co-branding there. Um, and um, has some amazing content out there now, um, some documentaries on Neymar and others. And at the same time, you'll say, I'm not really a content guy. I tell stories, but I tell stories more from the vantage point of the education I got at Nike, which is brand building. And you shared something on a, on a call that we had a couple of weeks ago uh, within Nike about how you think about brands, creating them, and building them. So I want to pick one. You have created a brand that has been pretty core to un uninterrupted from the beginning, which is more than an athlete. Yep. Um, uh, I'd love for you to share the origin story there, because as we talked about earlier today, if I think many of us may remember there was, there was someone on TV at some point who said, shut up and dribble. And I think you know, therein lied, lies an insight. And, I, and, and I'd love for you to share kind of where that brand came from and, and how kind of integrated into what you think the purpose of Spring, Spring Hill that yeah. brand is. You know, Uninterrupted is our sports brand at Spring Hill. If you think about well, Disney as ESPN, we're like this little miniature version. We have Spring Hill. We have Uninterrupted, which are, we call our athlete empowerment brand. And we like to say more than an athlete is our version of just do it, right? It's our just do it. So, um, in fact, it was Laura Ingram on, on Fox uh, who... Um, said athletes should just shut up and dribble. And putting her aside, my team, my chief creative officer, who's a brilliant guy, um, saw that. And again, going back to like storytelling and human emotion. Um, and, and to your point, I, I often say I'm not a, I'm not a filmmaker or a, I, I've never held a camera. The only camera I've ever held is my iPhone. Um, so I'm not a filmmaker or a screenwriter. But I love stories. I love telling stories. I love sitting at dinner. I love sitting around a campfire, anything, and telling stories. Just what I love and, and, and go to. And I think I think of everything in story. Everything to me is and and all great stories, whether it's about a superhero or a love story, whatever it is, starts with a human emotion. And like brands almost always start that way too. It's rarely that you see a brand really connect with us that we really love that starts from a, like, I want to make a widget and now create a story that's it's a little hard to do. Usually it starts with somebody with a feeling of emotion and they want to make something better. They want to make mm -hmm. something great that really connects to us. So our team saw that and the natural reaction to the shut up and dribble, it's just, a, it's just like shut up and dribble. I'm more than an athlete. It's just, it's just the cause and effect or the reaction but it came out in the form of a brand. We tur we've turned it into a mantra. We turned it into a mantra that became a brand, but it's really just a human emotion of like, if you, you know, if so, it'd be like if someone told you when you were the CFO, you're just a finance, just, just shut up and do numbers, right? You go, wait, <laughs> I, can do, I can do more than that. I'm sure it's happening <laughs> Those legal folks and the marketing course, folks, right? You know, you like stay out of, stay out right, of this. mediocrity. Go, look at, go go with the game, right? <laughs> But your natural reaction would be, I can do more than that. Hence yeah. why you're the COO, right? If you thought, if you would have just shut up and did numbers, you wouldn't be the COO today. So it's just a natural reaction that was a mantra that creatively we made into a brand. And then, and then we took it a step further. If you think about what our company is about, is empowerment. And if you think about just more than, that's what, we, that's what empowerment is. It's about helping people see or become or understand their more than so we can... We can drop athlete and you can fill in your blank more than a CFO, more than a brother, so whatever you want. And we built that mantra into a brand and kind of what our company stands for. The, um, the last time you and I uh, were in a setting somewhat like this, um, you explained, we, we talked a little bit about just the notion that even more than, if you think about sports, sports has always been such a powerful driver of culture. And it's one of the elements of culture. Um, 
that that kind of counterbalanced the, the, the dimensions and cultures within our society that have been pushed to the side or marginalized. The playing field was, an, was, was a playing field, a platform. Um, but in the past, to your point about more than an athlete, that platform and to the shut up and dribble was, was it sort of like, okay, we realize it's a platform, but keep it, keep it tight there. And, and you know, you're changing the game um, in terms of how athletes tell their stories and have impact. Um, it's particularly, I, I think, awesome, I don't, I don't have a better word for it, that you're getting this award today, because today, at least in business days, is the last day of Black History Month. And um, you and I have chatted a little bit about your perspectives on Black History Month, and without me even putting more context on it, um, you, you shared just a really fascinating perspective on how to think about what black history really is, and, and what we can kind of get out of history in terms of how we think about the future. Maybe you could share some of those yeah, thoughts. You know, um, I didn't even realize that it was the, the, the last day of February, but you know, because I always you know, tell people like, February is Black History Month, but the truth is, black history is American history. Like we're, you know, black people as a people, black and brown people too, brown people also, are uh, you know a big part of if you look at every vertical, the economy, you know, entertainment, media, sports, um, you know uh, railroads, everything. Black people were the were, were the backbone for a lot of that. I mean, tons and tons of you know the the first uh, uh, financially backed derivatives were slaves. Literally, you know, obviously in two thousand eight, we had the mortgage backed derivatives, which called caused the financial meltdown, but you know, in London, in England, they had long um, got rid of slavery, but it didn't mean they couldn't trade in it. So people in England were still trading, basically backing uh, people in the South who had slaves. They could get uh, derivatives and loans backed by their, their slaves. That was their collateral. So the economy, how things were traded, the idea of Wall Street, to everything. So the idea that black history gets jammed into 28 days never made sense to me, so I didn't even think about it because it is total history, but I think as black people now as we go into the, this new world, you know, um, creatively we've always been on the, um, it's just a fact, right, if you think about music, sports, you know, Louis Vuitton, Hiram Virgil, you know, a kid who, you know, was from Chicago, just like everything, we've always creatively been out on the, on the front end of every trend, Nike, I always say to people, Nike, you know, Nike, in my neighborhood, it was the athletes and the drug dealers who wore Nikes. That made me love Nike, because um, those were the guys I wanted to be like. So we were always on the, the, the front of that, of what was happening in America, and, uh, in America and, and in culture. And now if you look at the way of the world where we're going, it's always been big institutions who kept us out, right? Like, we were always kind of marginalized and we had to go create these our own sub little subcultures like hip hop, or like what, you know graffiti or whatever it is. That then once people realize, oh, it really everybody fucks with that. Yeah. Then big companies come in and mm -hmm. take it and use it however they you know they please and pay us a little money or whatever. But now what what the where the world is going, which you know it's going to take a lot of settling and things, institutions are not, maybe not gonna mean as much or able to keep us out as much, which, which I love that fact if you think about, you know, you know, obviously there's all this talk about crypto and NFTs and all this stuff. I, I don't track it from the sense of like, I couldn't tell you the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum right now, I have no idea. But what I love about it is creators now will get true value at some point and be really valued, which hopefully will start to close the wealth gap and put, uh, black and brown people on a level playing field because institutions like art galleries or universities or big companies can't push us to the side, marginalize us. That's what I love and I'm the most excited about where the world is going in the future. Yeah, you, you, you've, you've spoken a few times about black history being American history, being global history. Um, interestingly, as I can see the screen that says media, entertainment, and sports, one of the things you've said to me in the past is, um, black culture is probably the U.S.'s biggest export. I believe so. Um, because media, entertainment, yeah. sports. Um, 
Yeah, you guys sell Air Jordans all over the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we do. And actually, that's another area. Streetwear was another dimension of expression that kind of got around traditional institutions and then created emotion and, and culture and stories and traditional institutions, like you said, some of the big fashion houses and otherwise have, have, have now more embraced it or tried to kind of adopt or appropriate it. Um, the, um, the last question I want to ask you is based on our audience. So we've got an audience ranging from people in the world of business, the, the, the media, entertainment, sports world, to students. And I think maybe the reason we're all really here is because of the students, right? Because at some point, someone took a chance on us. You mentioned how LeBron um, gave you his platform to go create something amazing. So before we transition it over to Q&A, what advice do you have for these students as they think about what they want to do with their life? And I, I assume it's not kind of wallow in mediocrity on the fourth floor no, of uh, no. so no, <laughs> so I tall, assume you're going to have something some, other than that to some recommend. Some tall corporation just wasting <laughs> away being mediocre. Don't fucking do that. Um, <laughs> just don't. Um, I mean, you know, as a student, you know, I as I said, I um, I never got the chance to graduate university, but I learned a lot at Nike, and I think, you know, a big part of, of everything that's happened to me in my life is my curiosity. And, um, I, I, you know, when I meet people, I've spent a lot of time now with you, Andy, and you've seen me around people. I try, the key is I try to listen a lot. I mean, if you're, you know, you're in a school like this, obviously you're probably a, a great student. You've done well. This is a, a great university, a great institution. So, I, so you probably get to meet people like Andy, right? So... I always um, tell people, like, if you meet someone like Andy, the best way to get a lot of information from Andy is ask him about his successes, right? If you talk to successful people, the thing they want to talk the most about is the thing they've been, their successes, and it's a way to get a lot of information from people. So I always try and give young people that advice, because sometimes I meet people who are younger than me, and they want to tell me about what they want to do or some movie they want to do, and, like, that's just the quickest way to lose someone's attention, like if you want to get someone's attention, if you know what they've done in their career, what they, they'll be like, whoa, wow, that was, well, I can't believe you knew that one thing. How'd you know that? And it makes you, uh, it makes the conversation much more insightful. And then I would also say like, you know, one of the things I learned, I grew up, oh my God, my name Maverick from my grandmother. I grew up in a, uh, in a gambling house, literally. My grandmother ran in after hours when I was a kid. So from the time I was five and six years old, I was I swept up when the night was over. So I was always around card playing and crap shooting. So I learned that as a young age. But then later on in my life, what I realized is what that what, what you're really doing is like if you play cards, what you're really doing is any almost every card game is the same. You you get a hand, you turn it up, you see it, so you have a certain amount of information. If there's if you have six cards in your um, in your hand, then there are 46 other cards that you can't see. So you have to start making determinations based off the information you have. Then as every card is turned, either from the deck or someone exposes their hand, you gather more information. And every time you gather more information, a card is turned over, the upside and downside of your hand changes, right? So you could see your hand and think, oh, shit, I got a really good shot at winning this. But then if a card flips over, you're like, oh, my chances just went down or up, and you're constantly measuring upside versus downside in when you're when you're playing cards. It's a thing I learned as a kid, but as an as an adult, I realized that you can apply that to life. Like I, that's what, that's how I treat business. I'm all I'm constantly recalculating and and figuring out. Okay, how big can my company be? How far can I go with it? Oh, I got more information. Oh shit, I can go further than I thought. I got. Oh wait, let me dial this back. And you're just constantly dialing up and down that kind of upside versus downside based on information. But you have to understand how to get information. There's a lot of ways to get it these days, whether it's reading, talking to people, getting news. And as, as an individual, I happen to have a company, but also an individual with a career. You have to do the same thing with your career. You have to constantly be measuring, okay, should I do this, should I not? And you have to do it based on the information you have. And at some point, you either have to go for the hand or not. 
And that's the advice I would give you is like constantly be thinking about the upside, but also be going, okay, where's my floor? So I know where my upside and my downside is. Then as you get information, always be checking the, that upside and downside. Again, like if I go to this company, how far do I think I can go in this company based on how much do I love what they do? Do I really care about what they do? Do I like the people who run this company? Okay, well maybe I'll just do this to get it on my resume so I can go to the next thing. But you have to constantly be measuring those two things as you go through life is the advice that I can give you. That's what I use every day. So you and I have talked, before I uh, transition over, we've talked about imposter syndrome. So we talk about people who've had success, et cetera. The reality is I think at any stage in life, it's not just about success. You, you have that, those moments, you and I have talked about how we both have imposter syndrome and you've shared how you, what you just shared about how you use that passionate curiosity and information gathering to help overcome it. You go like, okay, if I feel like I'm, you know, if, you know, nobody's ready till they have to be, but at some point if you're like, I gotta fake it till I make it or get some information, I'm gonna figure out how to do that. But you've also, there was also another, so that was imposter syndrome, passionate curiosity, but there's another two word phrase, starts with A and A, and it's, and it's something that you shared is always in the back of your head motivating you. And as you think about your career or even your personal life, do you remember what that one is? You want yeah. to share it? Yeah, I just started thinking about this. I actually just started thinking about that and saying it probably the last two years or something because what Andy's saying is people would ask me to describe my company and it makes me laugh and that's how I came up with it. It's just like, if I had to describe my company, uh, I actually said this to, to Bob Iger when I was out raising money for the company two rounds ago, I said to people, I want to build Disney for culture. And, and to me, when I would say, hear myself say that, I would go, well, that's really fucking arrogant. Like, I mean, I mean like who, who says that? I mean, like, oh yeah, I want to build the next Nike. I want to build Apple, sure, sure. It's really arrogant, but it's also very aspirational. So then I started going, well, as an entrepreneur, one day Walt Disney had some aspiration he was probably arrogant about that too and and it wasn't about building the biggest entertainment company in the world it was just about making you know the happiest place on earth right like he was just saying like i want to create the happiest place on earth so i started saying and thinking about that i was like well if you really study it almost every entrepreneur someone who starts a business has an aspiration that is arrogant it doesn't because you're talking, I have to tell you about something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. If I have to talk to you about something that doesn't exist, that's arrogant. Like, I'm gonna build something, I'm gonna build this building, I'm gonna put this, there's, there is not a skyscraper standing here, but when you come back in two years, there's gonna be a skyscraper. At some point, when someone did that the first time, people went, oh, get the hell out of here, that makes no sense. So, I just started thinking about, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur like I have been my career, then you're gonna to have to be aspirational. You're gonna to have to unfortunately be arrogant about that aspiration. So I say, you know, I have arrogant aspirations for sure. I love it. So okay, just to sum that up, don't go get a media mediocre good ass job. <laughs> no. um, have arrogant aspirations, and 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 I would and I took away and play it out, realizing you don't have all the information. So go figure out how to get it. And like anything in life, you know. It's more about the person you're talking to than yourself. Absolutely. And you're going to learn a lot more if you, if you focus on that. All right, with that, I'll hand it over to, uh, oh, we got hands up already. Hand it over to the audience. Yeah, I got a, audience. got a quick question. Thanks for joining us today, Mavs. It's, uh, it's an honor to listen to you. Um, I'm Ryan Caradonna. Just had a quick question about EQ. You talked a lot about emotional intelligence, EQ. Wondering if you had a process when you were looking at raising funds um, to vet the other side of the table and make sure that they were really in line with your emotion and your brand rather than just a capital provider. Yeah, sure. Can I, can I know your name, by the way, your student? And yeah, Ryan Caradon. Maybe ask the question. Just say your name. and. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a second-year student here at Anderson, also a founder of a NFT company. So. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so when I was, I've raised money now uh, three times in my own company, and I've been very picky about it. Um, again, that's being a little arrogant, right? You're trying to raise money. So, right, most people say take the money from wherever, but I was just arrogant about it because I wanted people, I was very specific about having people who really understood my company, A, and B, the outcome that I was hoping for, they didn't have to necessarily want it, but they supported it. So meaning, um, you know, 
I, I've never raised from a VC fund. I have nothing against VC, but I think sometimes the outcomes they want and at the pace or the speed from my company it did not make sense. So I never raised from them. So I was in this last round, it was Nike. It was Epic Games, right? Both who, before putting money in and investing, were clients of mine, and I knew the people. I understood them. They understood my business. They understood where I wanted to go, and they want. They actually want me to get there. They actually are are rooting for me and helping me because along with investment, they became even bigger clients. So I was very, very. And then the third one is Fenway Sports Group. It was my partner from a long time, and then Redbird Capital, which is a private equity fund, which I also stayed away from for a while. But I met this one. It was led by an individual who's a founder who's still there. It's not like a big public one because I was just very arrogant and picky about, and Andy knows we went back and forth. I went back and forth for round and round with Nike for a while about even being picky about what they did or how much they did or did not invest in, and, and was very thoughtful. And just because I truly believe, again, going back to Andy's original question, if you end up with the wrong investors or partners, you quickly end up in that space even as a small company where it's all about KPIs and you have to show up and what are you doing, all this bullshit. But if people, at the day they sign up and put money and they understand where I, where I wanna go and where the rest of the company wants to go, then when I show up and go, oh, we did this or did that or we made this decision or didn't, they really understand. Well, they might not exactly understand it, but at least they're aligned for where we're trying to go. Yeah, I'll tell you just from, uh, there's a phrase I like to kind of spin, you know, it's business, it's not personal, and I, which in a weird way, it's unbelievable that's a phrase, right? It's horrific. Like, who would ever say that to someone, right? It's business and it's personal, and we've developed a personal relationship and a business relationship, and when we would kind of flip the switch to personal, as, as Maverick was talking to Nike, he would get calls from folks to your question about capital investing, and one of the, I think, epiphanies Maverick shared with me that he had was like, um, a lot of that is just money you know, to the spirit of game changer, we're here to change the game. And, do, and so I'm looking for someone that's going to come in and help us change the game. There's lots of money out there. Um, and what you guys had in your company was way more special than just a financial kind of investment in return. So, yeah, um, uh, real life execution of, your, of, your, of, of why you founded your company. Exactly. Yeah, thank you both for uh, sharing your insights. My name is Kendall Brown, and I'm a first year student here at UCLA Anderson. Uh, first things first, I must say that the shoe game on stage is impeccable, <laughs> although I did expect nothing less. Um, Mav, you talked about the importance of storytelling and the value of emotionally connecting to people, but to build a sustainable business in today's dynamic ecosystem, many brands are going deeper than that. In your opinion, what are the other important elements that have positioned Spring Hill to differentiate itself in such a crowded market? Um, great question. Thank you. Um, thank you for the compliment on my sneakers. I take it very seriously. Uh, um, Especially those for I take those who don't know, Space Jams. Um, Some storytelling right exactly, on your shoes. Exactly. That's the, you're always telling stories. You have to always be telling stories. Um, I think the what's helped us the most is we've, we've put a stake in the ground of what we care about. Now, granted, we're not some big public company, right? So it's a bit easier for us to do this. But the truth is, and, and Andy knows is again, going back to my days at Nike and, and my education there, it's like Phil quickly would say, you know, the people who don't fuck with you, they're never gonna fuck with you. So why even chase that? Put your stake in the ground. This is what we care about. This is what our company cares about. This is our values. This is what, this is what we do. Look at who we hire. Every, and, and it trickles through everything, right? The content we make, the people we hire, how our company culture is. That really helps you cut through because it allows you to do a bunch of things. But most importantly, when, you, when I talk about empowerment or what we do, it starts with the people who work at our company, so the people we hire. And then that translates out because if you really stand for something and have values, then you'll attract those people, and then that will emanate outside. And I think you have to quickly go, okay, this is who, you're never gonna, you know, there's very few companies, maybe Walmart sells to every, something to everybody, but that's very hard to, it's hard to boil the ocean, you know what I mean? So, you know, as I said, Andy knows this, Phil is like, hey, listen, people who don't fuck with Nike, they're never, they're never gonna, never fuck with Nike. So these are the people who we care about, so let's, because they align with us, their values align with what, what we care about. And I think I've taken that same approach to building our little companies, like 
what we care about is what we care about. We're going to make those that type of content with those type of creators, and we're going to empower our team. All the, the 200 people who work at our company, we're going to empower them first and foremost. And if we don't do that, then how the hell are we going to do it on the outside of bringing creators that we work with? So I really believe that's allowed us to carve out a little space because the people at our company know that, they feel that, and they show up to work every day, not coming to work, but because they're a part of something. Any, anybody else have questions? Ah, Give me one second. Ooh. He's in shape. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Mav. Really appreciate it. And Andy as well. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I am an EMBA student, um, which means I work full time and uh, go to class on the weekends. Uh, Mav, I was super interested by your recent investment in Mitchell and Ness, and now being at the you know stature that you are, curious to hear kind of your what catches your eye and your investment strategy for the future. Obviously, you can't share all the secrets, but just saw that and was very interested. and Wanted to hear more about it. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I just bought a, a piece of Mitchell Ness with some great partners. One, um, Michael Rubin, who owns Fanatics, and. Uh, uh, Jay-Z was actually the, the other uh, big shareholder in that. And, you know, my strategy is always the same, which is connection and storytelling. I'm not, I'm no financial wizard. I can look at a spreadsheet. I can look at a balance sheet or a P&L, but I, I really, I, that's not my expertise. My expertise is, is there a feeling and a story there? And, and, you know, if you think about a company like Mitchell Ness, there is a real story there. And, and as a kid, I remember obviously buying and wearing the, the jerseys. And one of my best friends, Rich, used to sell them out of his trunk, literally, and it's one of the ways that we met. So there was an emotional connection there. And then also Jay-Z, who used to wear them and then rapped about not wearing them. So it was like full circle. So for, to be doing it with him was just an amazing, amazing story. So that's where I start on investing is, can I, can I A, tell the story of why I did it, like I just told you? Because then that will translate to consumers why they should like the brand or be into it, right? We can actually tell that story. And that translates because it's real and, and authentic. So I start there. Obviously, then we looked at the numbers and the valuation and work and grow and all that stuff. But I really am interested in companies that truly have a connection and deep into communities. And Mitchell Ness is one of those. And not just how big can it be and how fast can it grow, but is it because I, I truly believe companies, the brands that are going to last and the ones that we're going to see explode and break through are going to be the ones that either have a great idea and an ideal. They mean something, something matters, something that they care about. And then they have a community that they go deep with. And, you know, people talk about that all the time, but there's very few companies who actually truly do that. And I think we're going to see some brands and companies emerge who do that in the real way. And the ones who we don't know what they stand for and they're just big for the sake of being big are going to struggle. Well, while we're looking for the next question, there's, a, there's actually a professor at UCLA, Adam Bradley, who's an English professor. He runs the Rap Lab, Race and Pop Culture Lab, and he talks a lot about nostalgia. And when the question was asked about Mitchell and Ness and how you talk about your company, when he was talking about nostalgia, he was talking about, and it's particularly relevant during Black History Month as well, nostalgia being kind of recuperating the best from the past and pulling it forward and kind of authorizing and creating a, a new future. And I think you know, that's, that's what, what some of those long-standing great brands totally. like Mitchell and Ness, um, obviously we hope to do that at Nike too. Oh, we got a hand, OK. Is, is this one? Oh, go for it. So in recent years at Nike, you guys obviously saw a lot of success in sales in embracing social change, community development, you know, the Air Force One drop around Colin Kaepernick. Um, how has your embrace of social change and community activism, social responsibility, change it, how, it, going from, say, a line item on the December budget to a more central focus of each initiative that you do? And then Maverick, same question for you. How are you incorporate? How are you taking that from being just sort of a afterthought at the end of the year to being a central part of what you're doing at Spring Hill? By the way, we didn't get your name. In. Oh, sorry, Mark Francois from Haitian American Caucus. Got All right. It. Um, I'll start. I think at, you know, obviously, we're a much younger company than Nike and, and Tiny, but um, at our company, it we start with 
you know, we're a storytelling company. We're in the business of telling stories, and we're in the business of telling stories um, that are empowering and through the lens of empowerment. And that can look like the actual content itself or who makes it. You know, the director, we just did a movie, House Party, and we brought in a director who was his first time ever, uh, a young director named Cal Maddock, who's awesome from Compton, the first time ever making a feature film. So we really focus on living and breathing what we say we're gonna do, and it emanates throughout the company, and it, bring, it brings a certain type of people to work for us, and a certain type of viewer and consumer for our products, our brands, and our entertainment. Um, it's a, a great question. I talked a little bit about how big companies can sometimes have to fight inertia to, to do things that are more purpose-driven, specifically with respect to social change and, and equality, um, as maybe a sharp point example of that. Uh, Mav talked earlier about how Phil has said from the beginning, listen to the voice of the athlete and empower the athlete and provide ins inspiration and innovation for the athlete. And we've always thought, thought about giving that, that, that voice of the athlete some volume. And so um, empowerment, the athlete, um, and particularly the athletes that we've always been connected to, that's always been our motivation at Nike. One of the limiting factors is that it's largely been a broadcast world and that it's largely been a broadcast world with a little shoulder programming before or after a game. You know, what's amazing about that question relative to me sitting here next to Maverick is, why do we invest in Maverick's company? We invested in Maverick's company because he's taking the world as it now is becoming. So that's kind of where, where it started with Nike, how, how it's going. How it's going is there, are, there is all kinds of access to platforms to make that voice more rich, more dynamic, storytelling, out, again, more than athlete beyond, beyond the field. And we're, we invested in Maverick's company to help us do that as fast as we possibly could and kind of to fight that inertia. You, you touched on a couple of the, of, uh, the people that we've worked with. You talk, talked about Colin Kaepernick, et cetera. And, and all I'd say is, this is, I, I, I'll, I'll go so far as to say, you know, sometimes people say this isn't the company's belief that is mine. This is both, Nike's and mine is. There's really no value more unassailable and core to being human than equality and equity. And Maverick shared, um, he dropped a couple F-bombs doing it. Um, Phil's point Sorry. of view. And the F-bomb, I'm cool with it. Phil drops F-bombs, too. Oh, shoot, man. This is going to be on the I didn't even know. I shoot. told you guys I grew up in Actually, he, he, everyone knows he does. But, but the short of it is, like, you know, you're going to have haters. And when you're a brand like Nike, the haters are going to use your brand as a platform to say what they want to say. Don't follow the haters. That, you know, what happened in that instance, what was being said as a, as a counter to that, had nothing to do with what our message was around believing in something, risking everything, equality and, and equity. And so you had some haters out there, but as Mav said, don't F with them. Uh, hi, Mav. Um, very honored to have you speak here today. My name is RJ Davis. I'm a third year undergrad econ student. And I wanted to know, um, is there any particular shortcoming or failure you've had on your journey to where you are today that's kind of helped you push you towards your goals or anything you particularly attribute to um, how you've you know, started the Spring Hill Company and other successes in the media and sports industry? Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for your question. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, day in, day out, there's always um, shortcomings and, and, you know, I had... <laughs> My high school coach used to always say, you know, in sports, they say, you, you can learn from a loss. And my high school coach used to say, yeah, you can learn a lot from a win, too. I'd rather learn from a win. <laughs> so <laughs> he's literally, oh, this one of the things he left me with is, yeah, you can learn from a win, too. Um, but yes, you know, every day, day in and day out, you have shortcomings. How you, you know, now I'm working in that and running this company and, and hiring people all the time. and hiring big jobs, I've, I've, I've just made, I've made decisions that were wrong or, or bad, but what you realize quickly is you have to uh, quickly understand that you made the mistake. You can't let it, uh, especially in a company like ours, because we're small, but we're not tiny, but, but one wrong decision quickly spreads throughout the company. You know, you hire one wrong person and the culture starts to fade fast. So you have to understand you made a bad decision quickly and be okay with, with, with 
looking yourself in the mirror and saying, I made, that wrong, I made a wrong decision, looking my team in the mirror and saying, I made the wrong decision, and quickly getting to a solution. So, you know, have I made mistakes and had shortcomings? Absolutely. But the key is getting to them. When you have a company like ours, we're fortunate, we have great culture, we have great people, so actually wrong decisions stick out quickly. That, that's, the, that's the thing you want. If you are, and as an individual, if you're an individual who's constantly working on yourself and getting better, then if you do something wrong, it'll pop up quickly. That's really what you want. All right, I'm gonna wrap us up. Again, in the spirit of Game Changer, um, you know, something that uh, is, is kind of awesome if, you, if, you're, if you're watching online, you can't really see it, but we've got a bunch of athletes in the room. We've got Ezra Freck, who came in top five in Tokyo in the high jump Paralympics. <laughs> I see some guys over there that can play football, like uh, DTR and some others, and some women that can play volleyball and soccer. And um, like I said, we've got Martin Germont, our AD, and our assistant AD, Josh Rebholtz, in the room and others. And you know, one of the things that I think Ma Maverick and I share in common, so I'll just end here, is the spirit of Maverick's a game changer. You know, I think both of us believe sport can change the world. And it's not just about playing sport. This is a business school talking about sports. It's a massive industry. There's tons of opportunity in it, and there's opportunity for people who are passionate about it, who otherwise are passionate, but their only outlet was to play. And I think the more inclusive we can be in terms of educating each other, learning from each other, growing and developing, and getting more people involved in the massive business of sport, um, we can have impact in that way too. So thanks you guys for the time, but most importantly, thanks to my buddy Matt. Thank you guys. And congrats.